Okay. I received the official cue, so I'm one. I want to let you know a little story about a rusty nail and how that relates to sin. You see, when I was 10 years old, I had a best friend. His name was Scott. And one of the things that we loved to do was watch movies. One of our favorite movies was The Karate Kid. And see, we would watch that, and then we wanted to be ninjas. We'd love to play karate and ninja work like it was nobody's business. So what we do is we're down to Scott's house, we tell his mom, we're just going to go outside and go play for a little bit. Just have a little bit of fun. So what we do is we make ninja stars. Every guy knows what a ninja star is. But we couldn't get to a flea market or a, a thrift store to grab one, so we made them out of cardboard. Now, these things were great, and we were going to play with them on the back porch. But we realized Scott's dad had a shop. And we had bigger plans than just <laughs> cardboard ninja stars. So we went into the shop and tried to figure out what we could do to make these weapons even better, more ninja-like. Well, we got black electrical tape and we put it all over the stars. Now that was real cool, but it wasn't cool enough. You see, in the junk jar that was up on the shelf, and I think every dad had a top shelf in a shop that no kid was ever allowed to get into, that was one of those shelves that I was never allowed to get into, but always kind of did. So in that junk shelf, there were some rusty nails. Just a few of them, but nobody ever really cared if a few rusty nails would be uh, gone. So we were going to use them for a very good situation. We were going to make better weapons. Better ninja stars. So we take the rusty nails to the point of the ninja stars. But see, when we threw those stars, they didn't fly just right. But after all this work that we put into it, we were even going to make even a better weapon. So we had a brilliant idea. Ninja star spears. <laughs> That's right. We took the stars, put them to a stick, and we went to the backyard and we did a little testing. We wanted to see how accurate our new weapons were. So I had Scott um, stand by a tree and I was going to throw it to see how accurate we were. Well, what we noticed is that we actually needed a target because we weren't that good. So we set up a target, and like I said, I had Scott get really close to the target so he could watch <laughs> as the spear came in. And that's exactly what he did. I stepped back with all my might, and like a good ninja, I launched that spear. It went flying through the air. It was aimed right at that tree, right at my target. And then the wind came. And that spear with all those rusty nails did exactly what you thought it would do. You thought it hit the target perfectly, right? No. It drifted just slightly into Scott's leg. <laughs> so I hit the mark, but it was just the wrong mark. The mark was Scott. So we did what every boy did. We just kind of pulled the spear out of his legs, kind of put some duct tape on it and thought that would make everything good. Well, the blood didn't stop coming out of his leg. And so after a while, he had to go in and tell his mom what we did. His dad was at work. His mom told my mom and my dad, and they found out what we did. That was not a good spirit throwing ninja type of day. But you see, after going back out and playing, I had no intention of spearing my friend. We were just going to go out and play. But one thing led to another, one bad choice after another, and there it was. Scott had a spear in his leg. How stupid was that? I was inducted into the Stupidity Hall of Fame. Now you see, sin can make us stupid. Sin can take us places that we had never intended to go. Sin can cause us to do things that we never intended to do. Sin is a serious thing. So I want to tell you a story here. It's a story of a guy who was also inducted into the stupid Hall of Fame. This guy started out 
with just a lazy morning. And he did a double take at a hot woman. And he ended up with murder. And he lost his family. The story is about David. So go ahead and turn to, if you have something that you can turn to, or a computer you can open up. Turn to 2 Samuel. We're going to start off in chapter 11. As you're turning there, I just want to tell you a little bit about chapter 11. See, it was springtime when this was going on. And in the spring is when all the kings would go off to war. And David sent his army out to battle without him. One day while he was, his army was off to battle, David slept in until late afternoon. The man was tired. He was lazy. He got up and he wandered out to his balcony, kind of just probably stretching out, looking to see what the world could show. And he looked down and saw a beautiful woman taking a bath. Now let me explain to you a little bit about the baths back in that time. In those days, it was common for house to have cisterns on top of the roof so the water could get warm. It was common for women to wait till midday to go out and take a bath because generally the men were out in the field working or their guys were out of the battle. So they really didn't have to worry about shower curtains. They were on top of the roofs and who could really see up on the roof? David could. Well, so the sun was coming down and heated that water and so Bathsheba was out taking, taking a bath. David was so taken by her beauty that he sent someone out to find her. The servant noticed that the woman was Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah and the soldier in David's army. The servant brought Bathsheba to the palace and David slept with her. And then she went home. Because that's the type of power David had. Bathsheba found that she was pregnant and she sent word to David that she was pregnant with a child. David began to panic and sent word to Joab, his general of the army, send Uriah to me. Send him back here. Because he had a plan. See? Consequences matter, so he had to come up with a plan. Uriah came back and David told him to go home and I'm sure the conversation went something like this. My friend, you've been in battle a long time. Go home. It's okay. Take a nice hot bath and rest there for the night. Now your wife's going to be there. It's okay. Relax. Spend some time with her. It's okay. Because he was actually hoping that Uriah would spend the night with his wife and that that would cause the pregnancy to be completely covered up. But see, Uriah was committed to his army and so he didn't go home. He stayed at the palace gates and he slept there. He didn't go home to his wife. Now, David trying to fidget around and if you've lived in sin, you know what that fidgeting is like? trying to figure out, okay, how else can I cover up? So David came up with a plan B. He uh, had Uriah stay one more night and then got him drunk. And he thought, surely he'll now go home and be with his wife. But Uriah still refused to go home and relax. Why? Because his men were still at war and he felt an obligation to his men. So David sent Uriah back to the battlefield with a message to Joab. Put your eye on the front lines of the battle and then have your reinforcements pull back. Kind of imagine that. He sent him out to the front because he knew what would happen. It was like every man stepped forward, everybody else steps back. He was out there by himself. So Joab sent a message back to give a full report of what happened. And when the messenger told David that some of the king's men had died, as well as Uriah, the great warrior. David told the messenger to tell Joab, don't let this make you upset. You know what happens at war sometimes? Good people get killed. killed. Don't worry about it so much. The setup was in place. Plan B didn't work. Plan A didn't work. Plan C did. The murder of a good man to cover up a sin. David had never intended to kill anyone. But consequences and actions continue to happen. 
I mean, he told his men, don't worry about it. Good things happen. We know those happen. When Bathsheba heard about her husband's death, she mourned for him. And after the mourning was over, David had her brought to the palace, and then he married her. She became his wife and had their children. But what David had done displeased the Lord. So, in this, what happened? How did David go from just taking a quick look out of his back porch to a murderer? How in the world did he get there? Why did he end up doing something so stupid? Let me give you a couple points of why I think why. The first one is carelessness. David was in the wrong place. He was supposed to be at war with his men. David was lazy. He got up late in the afternoon and he had nothing to do. David ignored his purpose. He was not leading his kingdom like he should have been. What's the other reason? Because of compromise. David wondered. He let his eyes and his thoughts wonder where they should not have been. David entertained temptation instead of fleeing temptation. He didn't see the line of sin and run away from it. He wanted to be like one of the great Lorenzas, the trapeze artist. He wanted to walk that line as close as he could. So he entertained temptation. David invited the forbidden into his house. And David sinned. David sinned because he committed adultery. So what do you do with that? Well, the third part is you have the cover-up. First thing he tried to do was to ignore his sin. How do you do this? He just sent Bathsheba away. He thought, well, if I can just get rid of the situation, it's not ever going to phase me. David tried to hide his sin. He did that by calling Uriah home. David tried to get others to lower their standards to cover up his sin. Twice David tried to get Uriah to go home to be with his wife, lowering his standards. David sinned again in murder to cover up his first sin, so it keeps compounding on each other. So let me go back to the story a little bit. I mean, this is in chapter 12. David tries to cover it up, but God still sees everything. See, in chapter 12, God spoke to Nathaniel and revealed David's sin to him. Nathaniel confronted David and called for him to repent, called him into a spirit of repentance. God said that David would have to live with the scars of his sin. Well, how does he live with the scars of his sin? It's through the catastrophe. It's the price of the sin. See, David allowed lust in. David committed adultery. Bathsheba was violated. Uriah was disgraced. There was an illegitimate child. Uriah was challenged to lower his standards. David asked Joab to arrange the murder of Uriah. Uriah was murdered so that the other, and so were other innocent men. Consequences. David's family, friends, and kingdoms were tarnished with the sins and the scars of those sins. David's family was blemished and affected. David's own sons watched this happen and in turn lived out David's sins in their own lives. David's son Ammon raped his half-sister. David's son Absalom killed his brother. Absalom rebelled against his father and God. See, David could not control what they did and he could not contain his sin. David's sin affected everybody around him. David had no idea what one brief moment of sin would bring on himself and all of those around him. So what did David do? So we know what happened, but what did David do? So when David confronted David, David 
had a broken heart, David confessed. He confessed to what happened. Sin had made David's heart hardened and blinded him. David did not just confess, but he also repented with a broken heart. See, we find it in David's prayer in Psalm 51. 1 and 2 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me with my sin, from my sins. 10 through 12 says, Create me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, for I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. See, true repentance comes from a sacrificial of a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. So what is brokenness? Brokenness is a breaking of our sins from the hardening of our hearts. It's allowing God to shatter the holds that sin has on us. It's being broken requires a willingness for us to change. So we know how little consequences can lead up to great actions. A cardboard throwing star ends up maybe even grounded for weeks. David, because he was lazy, led to him being a murder. Consequences have actions. So, where are you? Where are you tonight? Are you being careless with temptation? Are you putting yourself in places that you shouldn't be? Here's a hard one. Are you spiritually lazy? Spiritually sleeping in and not doing anything. <laughs> Are you walking into unnecessary temptation? Are you walking that line instead of running away from it? Are you compromising in sin? Are you inviting temptation into your house? Into your life? Are you entertaining temptation instead of fleeing from temptation? Are you trying to blur God's standards for your life? Are you rationalizing your sin? Are you covering up your sin? Are you denying that you're living in disobedience to <coughs> God? Are you trying to hide your sin from others or even yourself? Are you compounding your sin by lying or other sins? <coughs> <coughs> Are you headed for that catastrophe sin, sin that causes? Have you experienced the scars of sin? See, sin always leads to death. Spiritual death. Has your heart been hardened and callous? Think about this. <coughs> if David would have just stopped at any point and repented. He could have saved himself and so many others from the scars of his sin. You see, because for tonight, there's still hope. God still accepts the broken and contrite heart and repentance. When we are truly broken, falling on our knees before God, <coughs> not only confessing to be sorry of our sins, but willing for God to break us in our hurting hearts, and break us so that we can be molded into a new creation. It is at that point, that point, that we find true salvation. It is complete forgiveness. Why keep pretending you are right with God when you really can be right with God? Why pretend you are a genuine Christian and put all the works into your spiritual mask you wear. Why are you hiding? All we have to do is our, our allow ourselves to be broken 
in repentance. God is not looking for righteous acts. God is looking for our brokenness and our repentance. Let's pray for today. Amen.